Okay, folks, let's get started. Let's get started. Okay, there we go. How's everybody doing? Bueno. The day after the exam. That's a little loud, isn't it? Ew. That's a little better? Okay. Um, I always like to get a little feedback uh, about the exam. So um, I've talked to numerous of you just asking briefly how it went. So now I'll ask the class as a whole. How uh, was the exam? Was it long? Yeah, it was long. Okay. Definitely doable. Definitely undoable. Fair, okay. Surprises? Were there surprises on there? No surprises? I must be getting boring in my old age. What's that? I thought three was worded very poorly. Three, which was? The one example, the rule, the rule of thumb about the pH. The oh, the rule of thumb about, so yeah. you had to tell me the, the, the pH at which, uh, the, the highest pH at which you would have a charge of approximately zero. Yeah. <laughs> So that was basically applying the rule of the pH is more than one unit below the pKa versus one unit above. So you apply that rule, and you should get a pH of 11 uh, for that. So, yeah. They probably could have been worded better. I'll agree. Yeah. OK. So which pro any problems in particular? Western blotting one. Okay. Misread. The Western blotting one you misread. So, yeah, I find that, that um, one of the most common questions I get, and so that one of the reasons I answer all the questions is so that students get a consistent answer uh, to their questions. So you don't have somebody telling you more over here, you know, depending on who you ask the question of. So you get hopefully the same uh, basic thing for me. So I get a pretty good perspective of what students see in the exam. And um, it's interesting. She said that, you know, that the um, one of the questions was, you know, that really interpreted it wrong or looked at it wrong. And I would say probably 75% of the time when a student asked me a question, like the, one of the questions I was most commonly asked on the exam was the amino acid ones, right? Okay, so sulfhydro. Which amino acids have sulfhydro groups? Which amino acids have carboxamide groups? And so, well, do, I, do you want me to tell you where they are? Do you want me to tell you the structures? And it's, I, I would point at it and I would say, name the amino acid. And that's what the, that's what the problem was asking. So. It's important to read carefully in that. I'm happy to answer your questions, um, but it's important to read carefully what I'm asking for uh, in those, those problems. And I think the tendency where, where people trip up sometimes is they want to try to interpret what I'm asking. And that's where some of the problems arise. So um, again, I'm happy to answer the questions, uh, but it's important to read carefully what I'm asking for in those questions. And I'll be honest, I won't tell you I'm the best writer of exams or exam questions. Um, no matter how much you try in a class of this size, you're going to have sometimes you know, problems with interpreting or, or uh, what you mean in a question. Um, I understand that. And um, hopefully, uh, those end up being not too many points. Uh, in the uh, course next term, we'll have uh, the exam format changes a lot. And so uh, we will have um, many questions, each of which only worth about two points. And that way, if you have a question that you really don't understand, well, maybe you didn't lose a lot of points because of that. So uh, hopefully that, that, that lessens that issue. Other thoughts about the exam? Um, this exam, as I said before, is the one that's the most commonly the one where students will have issues with time. Hopefully time wasn't too much of a problem. Um, next exam, time is less of a problem. And the final exam, it's almost never a problem. And next term, it's never a problem. So. Uh, you've gotten through the worst of them in terms of time and uh, how much it takes to do that. Okay, well thank you for your feedback and if you have comments that you'd like to make not in front of the class, to me separately, I'm happy to listen to them and I promise I don't take them personally so uh, you don't have to like my exams I, and I won't, I won't hold it against you. So if that is the case then please let me know. I, I think the feedback is important uh, for me to hear how you see things and um, I do take those things into account so I do, I do appreciate those, that feedback. Okay, well, last time we uh, spent a lot of time and effort going through mechanism. And today I'm just going to briefly touch on that um, before I go forwards. And then um, uh, say some more about, because now we've gone through this mechanism, you hopefully have some um, perspective. And as a result of that perspective, you're going to see how 
that mechanism can be applied to many other enzymes. Okay? We're going to see some common features arising as a result of the knowledge that you have uh, of the action of the serine proteases. Well, refreshing your memory, we were talking last time about the mechanism of chymotrypsin. And chymotrypsin was, in fact, a serine protease. So protease, of course, means it breaks peptide bonds. And serine component of it means that the serine plays an active role in the breaking of those peptide bonds. Serine is a part of the catalytic triad. And the catalytic triad consists of uh, aspartic acid, histidine, and serine. Now, I'm not going to go step by step through this, but I will tell you, as I've told several students that I've sat down with uh, to discuss the mechanism, and yes, I have had students already asking me about this mechanism, so, um, and that is, don't get lost for the, uh, in the forest for the, uh, don't, don't lose the forest for the trees, okay? There's a lot of detail up here, and one thing I can tell you I'm not going to do is push electrons around, all right? You didn't see me do it last time, you're not going to see me do that. This is not the important thing about this enzyme, or any of these enzymes. Yes, electronic changes do have to happen. And those electronic changes that we saw happening with the catalytic triad resulted in the removal of a proton off of serine. That created an alkoxide ion. That alkoxide ion is the key to the overall process because that alkoxide ion is very, very reactive. The reason it's reactive is it has extra electrons. It has a negative charge. It's not a partial charge. It's a negative charge. It's lost its proton. That electron-rich serine okay, side chain, that alkoxide ion, is what we call a nucleophile. And I'm sure you talked about these in organic chemistry. A nucleophile is an electron-rich uh, nucleus that seeks another nucleus that is not so electron-rich. Okay? This electron-rich oxygen atom attacks the carbon of the peptide bond, the carbonyl group. Why does it attack the carbonyl group? Well, the carbonyl group carbon is linked to an oxygen, and guess who has greater electronegativity? Oxygen. So oxygen is pulling electrons away from carbon. Carbon is relatively electron poor, and therefore this electron-rich alkoxide ion tackle, or attacks the electron poor carbon. That's why that happens. This nucleophilic attack is the common feature you're going to see among all of the enzymes we're going to talk about today. Nucleophilic attack. Creating a nucleophile is a very, very important component of catalytic action. All right, so it attacks it. When it attacks it, it creates an unstable intermediate that's stabilized temporarily by the oxyanion hole. That allows it to fall apart without reacting with the enzyme. It falls apart into two pieces. One piece here that quickly disappears and the other piece that's covalently attached to the serine. That's this guy right here. You see it covalently attached. That covalent bond between the serine and the other part of the peptide is broken in, the, in almost exactly the same mechanism as you saw before. Okay? In this case, an alkoxide, I'm sorry, in this case, a nucleophile is created by pulling a proton off of water. That creates a reactive hydroxyl group. And the reactive hydroxyl group attacks that same carbon as was attacked before. But now what falls apart is the bond between the carbon and the serine's oxygen. When that falls apart, the peptide gets released. And then everything rearranges to go back to its original state. Okay? So there's a lot of mouthful of words there. Stepwise, it's not much. And no, I'm not going to ask you to draw this. I'm not going to ask you to draw this. I think if you can explain to me what's happened in words in a reasonable depth, I think that you understand this process. Okay? So there are three components of this cave that I described at the active site that are important. There's the place where the reaction is catalyzed. That's the catalytic triad. There was the S1 pocket, which was the place that the substrate bound. Well, what was the substrate? The substrate, remember, it's... it's it's cutting next to, in this case, phenylalanine residues. So the phenylalanine side chain is fitting into the S1 pocket. The third structural feature of the active site that was important was the oxyanion hole, and that was there to keep that unstable polypeptide from reacting with the enzyme. It's simply allowing it to fall apart. The, 
peptide bond to break, and then it lets everything go. So those three components of the active site are very, very important for chymotrypsin to be able to work in the way it does. If at any point we did not have either the, stabi the stabilization or the release of any of these components, we would not be able to get back to our starting point, and we would have an enzyme that would catalyze exactly one reaction, and that would be it. So in order for the enzyme to continue to function as a catalyst, we have to go back to the original state of the enzyme. That's what's happening in this overall um, circular structure that you see here. OK, questions about that? Do you have to memorize that diagram? Well, since I'm not going to ask you to draw the structure, um, I would say I'm not going to ask you to reproduce that structure, no. Okay? But I think, and I, I see you smiling, so I know you're, sort of, you're, you're saying tongue in cheek with this. But um, the, um, the main points of the diagram I think that you should understand in terms of the, the features of that structure, and I think also the description of the steps. Okay? Um, so I think that's, that's important to, to, to get, a, get a grasp on, yes. OK? Is the alkoxide ion attacks the carbonyl, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And the water, the ionized water down here also attacks the same carbonyl. OK. So um, hopefully you've got a handle on that mechanism. And uh, with that in hand, we can go and we can consider some other things. So yes? The three components. So you had the catalytic triad the oxy anion hole, and the S1 pocket. Now I'm going to say a little bit more about the S1 pocket in just a minute. Okay? The S1 pocket is the key to where the enzyme cuts. It's the key to where the enzyme cuts. Okay? Now, people ask me, well, what's the oxy anion hole? The oxy anion hole is just a little chamber that is fairly unreactive that stabilizes this intermediate. You can see the stabilization going on with a couple of hydrogen bonds. It's basically allowing this unstable structure to fall apart. That's what the, the function of the oxy anion hole is. If it doesn't stabilize that, that unstable intermediate, then the unstable intermediate may react with the enzyme. And that's going to that's be a suicide inhibitor at that point. Okay? So we don't want this guy reacting with the enzyme, so the oxy anion hole is stabilizing, keeping the unstable structure from reacting with the enzyme and instead allowing it to fall apart, like the dating relationship I described the other day. Okay? All right. Now, all three of these features that I just described to you are found in all serine proteases. All of them are. The oxy anion hole, the catalytic triad, the exact same catalytic triad, and the S1 pocket. Okay? Now, that would suggest to you that, in fact, there are uh, similarities between these enzymes. And no surprise, there are many similarities between these enzymes. This figure shows schematically the structure of trypsin and chymotrypsin, two different serine proteases. One's in red, one's in blue. It doesn't matter which one's which. Okay. If you look at them in three dimensions, okay, what you discover is, boy, there's an awful lot of places where they really overlap. This figure, I hope, reinforces to you something I've been saying all along, and that is that structure is essential for function. They have similar mechanisms of action. It's no surprise they're going to have very similar structures. They do have some differences. And we're going to talk about one of those differences in just a minute. But if you look at this, there's really not a gigantic amount of difference between these two enzymes. Okay. Okay. Both catalyze the breaking of peptide bonds. The only difference from a reaction perspective is that trypsin has a different specificity than chymotrypsin does. Okay. Well, specificity comes from the binding site. Where is it that the substrate is being bound? Now, I want to remind you that the substrate, when we look, looked and talked about um, chymotrypsin, here's a polypeptide. Chymotrypsin is cutting next to either this phenylalanine or, in this case, this methionine. So chymotrypsin can work with several different side chains. It's this component, the phenylalanine, 
that is being bound in the S1 pocket. The S1 pocket sort of holds that. Or the S1 pocket holds this. In other words, if, we, if I gave chymotrypsin or gave this polypeptide to chymotrypsin, it would cut adjacent to both of these. Doesn't matter which one first, one, then the other. But it would do it because it, its S1 pocket would make a nice little chamber to hold that, or a nice little chamber to hold that. The S1 pocket would not hold that. And that's what I'm getting ready to show you why it won't hold that. Okay. So this is how specificity happens. Specificity happens because there are specific things that will bind and specific things that will not bind in that pocket. And if you remember, it's the binding that's critical for that slight change in shape of the enzyme that gives us uh, rise, ultimately, to the alkoxide ion. Well, this figure shows the S1 pocket of three different serine proteases. Okay? Three, um, uh, yeah, three different serine proteases. Here's chymotrypsin. Chymotrypsin has an S1 pocket that you'll notice is, has no charges designated inside of it. It's fairly nonpolar, and it's fairly large. There's room in there for something as big as a benzene ring, like we see on a phenylalanine. There's room in there for a long, nonpolar side chain, like we see in methionine. Okay? The nonpolars really like this guy right here. So they bind in there, and the enzyme changes shape once they bind. Glutamic acid with, a, with an ionized side chain is not going to like this. It doesn't like it because there's nothing to attract it to it. It's like putting oil with water. It doesn't have any reason to enter into there. And as a consequence, glutamic acid doesn't fit into there. And the enzyme does not cut next to glutamic acid as a consequence of that. Phenylalanine or methionine bind in there. Then the enzyme uh, cuts adjacent to them. Trypsin, I've already told you, is very similar to chymotrypsin in terms of its structure. It differs slightly in its S1 pocket. Look at what trypsin has. Trypsin has, at its very bottom, an aspartic acid residue that is negatively charged. What do you suppose is going to be attracted to that? A positively charged side chain. And it's no surprise that trypsin cuts adjacent to lysine and arginine positively charged side chains at physiological pH. They're attracted to this site. Last, we have on here elastase. Elastase is another serine protease, and it tends to cut adjacent to things that have fairly short nonpolar side chains, like, let's say, alanine, something that only has a methyl group hanging off of it. Well, it's a fairly nonpolar chamber. It's got a plug in the bottom, so a big side chain like phenylalanine won't fit in there. But a small one like alanine will. Okay? So we begin to see how that S1 pocket now really determines where the enzyme is going to cut. I gave the example of I grab the person with the red shirt, the red shirt right here, and the cutting site is over here, that fixed distance away person is, the, that, that bond is going to be broken, right? Well, if the red shirt is right here, and right here is the, immediately adjacent to it are the two people holding the hands that I talked about, okay, that fixed distance away from the place where the binding site occurs is where the reaction occurs. So it's no surprise then that the binding site really determines where the cutting reaction is going to occur as well. And that's what happens in all serine proteases. Okay, questions about that? <laughs> quiet group, quiet group. Okay. Um, I'll just flip through a couple figures here. These are just other serine proteases, just again reinforcing the idea that look, there's a serine, there's a histidine, there's an aspartic acid, there's an oxyanion hole. S1 pocket's not shown, but it's down here as well. Everything that we saw in chymotrypsin and trypsin, we see in all of the serine proteases. Here's uh, another one. I didn't catch the name when I flipped it. It was carboxypeptidase. Okay? So aspartic acid, histidine, serine. There's the oxyanion hole. Again, here's the S1 pocket. We see exactly the same sorts of things. So structure is necessary for function. Now. Um, 
This figure is a little confusing, uh, and hopefully it's, and, and I don't want to make too big of a deal of it because it's not a big deal, but this, this figure is aimed at showing the relative importance of each of the amino acids in the catalytic triad. Okay? What we're measuring here is the log of the KCAT, that is how fast the enzyme works, how well the enzyme works in essence. There's the wild type enzyme. This is a log scale. Every tick is tenfold different. Okay? Wild type enzyme has a certain KCAT uh, for cleavage. What if I take that wild type enzyme and I mutate the serine to an alanine? If I mutate serine to alanine, now I don't have an OH that can get, that can get uh, ionized to perform the reaction. What happens? Well, look at this. It goes one, two, three, four, five, six, about six and a half to seven orders of magnitude lower reactivity. Seven orders of magnitude is one ten millionth. Okay? So if I remove, I change the serine in a single mutation to an alanine, I get one ten millionth the activity of the wild type. That tells us that serine is pretty darn important in that process. We see a tiny amount of activity. Why do you suppose we would see a tiny amount of activity if we don't have a serine? Good exam question. The rest of the structure of the enzyme is facilitating, is there to facilitate the reaction. So over a long, give it a long enough period of time, it will do a little bit of catalysis. Okay? So we don't completely wipe it out. Here's the uncatalyzed reaction right here, no enzyme. So it's faster than an uncatalyzed reaction by about, what, a thousand fold, but one ten millionth that of the, of the of fully functional enzyme. If I convert histidine to an alanine, I see about the same thing I saw for serine. That tells us that histidine is also playing a very critical role in that process. If I convert the, the aspartic acid to an alanine, I don't lose as much activity. In other words, the, the aspartic acid, this tells us that the aspartic acid is not as important as the other two components are for uh, the, the catalysis uh, done by this enzyme. And of course, if I do all three, no surprise, they're down at the low level uh, right here. OK. Make sense? Yes, uh, Robert. Will the enzyme still be able to go through all the catalysis? Yes. So we're measuring, we're measuring KCAT. So we're, ma we're measuring the catalysis. That's correct. But one ten millionth of its, of its previous rate. Yeah. So a, a tiny amount of catalysis that is more than uncatalyzed but one ten millionth of what the wild type is. Okay? Okay, so that's um, pretty much what I want to say about chymotrypsin, I think. Um, let's turn our attention to some other proteases. <laughs> so, yes, there are enzymes in the world besides proteases, but we focus early on on proteases because they really do, they really are easy to study from a, a mechanistic uh, point of view. Here, um, as depicted on the screen, is uh, an example of a related protease called a cysteine protease. And a cysteine protease does not have a catalytic triad. And it does differ a little bit from the serine proteases in other respects. But it has two features that should make you think something like the serine proteases. There's our friend histidine. We saw histidine was important in the serine proteases. We don't have a serine. We have a cysteine. Okay? I'll let you think for a minute about how that might affect its catalytic activity. Here's another one that may be a little harder to imagine. It's called an aspartyl protease. It uses two uh, um, uh, ions of aspartic acid in its catalysis. And at first, it seems like it's a very different kind of a mechanism. But as I hope to show you, it's not very different at all. Okay. And last, here is a, cl a class of enzymes known as metalloproteases. These guys use a metal ion as part of their catalytic action. And again, though on the surface it looks very different, you're going to see common commonality of all of these three with the serine proteases that I've been describing. Okay. So let's take a minute and go through that. 
here's the active site where the reaction is catalyzed, that is the catalytic uh, site for the cysteine proteases. When the proper substrate binds into a cysteine a protease, in, in, into the uh, active site of a cysteine protease, the enzyme undergoes a slight shape change, just like we saw with the serine proteases. And that slight, that slight shape change brings the histidine residue relatively close to the sulfhydryl side chain of cysteine. Guess what happens? The proton gets pulled, and guess what that leaves behind? A reactive sulfur. Because that sulfur is electron rich, the proton leaves its electrons behind. This is an S minus when that happens. This S minus is a nucleophile. It attacks the carbonyl just like we saw with the serine protease. It makes a covalent intermediate just like we saw with the serine protease. Okay? So cysteine protease really does very much the same thing that the serine proteases were doing, the difference being it has a sulfur here instead of having an oxygen here. Okay? All right. Yes, uh, Stephanie? So is there an oxy anion hole? Is there an oxy anion hole? This would be a good exam question. Would you expect that this would have something equivalent to the oxy anion hole? Yes. yes. yes because this is going to be a reactive intermediate that is going to be unstable and you want to give it a chance to fall <coughs> apart just like before. So yes, you do see something like the oxy anion hole there. Yep. Yes? And it also goes through the fast it, Does it also go through the fast stage and the slow stage? You would predict that exactly, yes, it would. Yes, it would. Okay, good questions. Good, you're thinking about this. All right. So cysteine proteases are pretty easy to understand once you understand serine proteases. Aspartyl proteases are a little bit different, but as I said, I hope to convince you they're not that different. Aspartyl proteases have at their um, uh, catalytic site, they have two aspartic acid side chain residues. And it doesn't really matter which one is which for uh, the purposes of this. Okay? These two uh, are positioned so that here's the peptide that has been uh, placed in place. So again, what we have is, first of all, the proper substrate binding. That place is this carbonyl carbon in the right place. These guys, because of the slight position changes, now activate water. So this guy, in this case, is the left one is shown here. This guy grabs a hydrogen <laughs> off of water, and guess what it creates? A nucleophilic hydroxyl negative charge. And guess what that nucleophilic hydroxyl is going to do? It's going to attack the carbonyl and break the bond. Okay? So again, we're creating a nucleophile just like we created in the serine proteases and just like we created with the cysteine proteases. In this case, though, we have something that's fundamentally different. There's going to be something different about the mechanism of this enzyme compared to the other two. Anybody know what it is? Double displacement? No, nice try. There's a step in this one that's not going to be, that, 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 that's, that's not going to be in this one that is present in the other two. What's different here? What's that? Proton transfer? Well, in both cases, before, there were proton transfers. So, no, that's not different. When, the, when we talked about the other two enzymes, wasn't there an intermediate that got linked to the enzyme? The serine protease, what happened? We had an intermediate that got linked to the enzyme, and we had a fast step and a slow step, right? Why did we have the slow step? We had to release the second peptide. Right? We had to release the second peptide. And somebody asked me, Does, do we have a fast step and a slow step in a cysteine protease? The answer is yes, we do, for the same reason. We've got to release that peptide from the enzyme. Do you see anything here where this guy is getting attached to the enzyme? No. Okay. So you would predict this guy would not have a fast step and a slow step. It would have one step. This is not a two-step process. because. There's no part of that peptide that is becoming attached to the enzyme. 
That's what causes the slow step in the serine and cysteine proteases. Does everybody understand that? Okay, so, so to repeat that, in the case of the cysteine and the serine proteases, okay, the creation of the alkoxide ion, or in the case of the sulfur, the sulfur ion, all right, in both of the, those cases, the ion was a part of the protein. The sulfur was a cysteine on the protein, so it was, it was physically attached to it. The alkoxide ion was on the serine of the protein, so it was physically attached to it. So when that nucleophile attacked, okay, one part got released, that left something behind that was still atta attached. And what was attached what was, was what was originally the reactive oxygen or the reactive sulfur, both of which are attached to the enzyme. That means, therefore, that the cysteine and serine proteases are going to have a covalent intermediate that's got to be gotten rid of, otherwise the enzyme is dead. In this case, water is doing the attacking. Okay? There's nothing, the only thing that's getting attached here is OH is getting attached. And OH is not attached to the protein. It's floating freely. So it does its attacking. It splits the peptide bond just like we saw before. But now that OH is what becomes linked. And the OH and the piece go floating away. So the two pieces just split at that point. They don't remain attached to the enzyme. One step, not two. Okay, does that help? Yeah. That's, that, that's a hydrogen bond. That, that's, that, yeah. Yeah. So remember, the, the, yeah, it does go away in the end. So the enzyme, I, I haven't told you the regeneration steps, but this will regenerate because remember, this is a carboxyl group, and that carboxyl group is going to have a pK at physiological pH. It's readily going to give that proton up. So not a problem. So, yes, so the, the water attacking is, in other words, the pulling away of this proton from this is necessary for this guy to do the attacking to break that bond. Yes. Yes. This hydrogen bond? Well, this hydrogen bond is just, I mean, it's just a hydrogen bond. So remember, hydrogen bonds are weak. So they don't hold things together. That thing is just going to go floating away. OK? So those hydrogen bonds are not strong enough. They're going to hold this thing in place. Let me show you the other examples. So when we go back to serine proteases, OK, when we looked at serine proteases, we had right here a hydrogen bond. We broke the bond. See, here's the break right here. There's no bond between that nitrogen and that carbon. The only thing that's holding this piece together to the enzyme is a hydrogen bond. And notice, it very quickly pops off. OK? So exactly the same thing is happening here. It's just that the, the um, uh, nucleophile is not a part of the enzyme. It was something that was water. OK? You guys are too tired from the last exam, I think. OK. All right. Last. Uh, here I will talk about metalloproteases. And you're going to hopefully start seeing a theme. Metalloproteases use an ion, as, uh, I'm sorry, a metal ion as part of their catalysis. And a very common one is zinc. Okay? Zinc has a plus two charge. And that plus two charge is very useful for stabilizing and holding in place in the active site a water. I've heard this before now. Okay. Water is polar. The O is partially negative. The H is partially positive, right? So this partial negative is attracted to the positive of this zinc. This water is held in place at the catalytic site. When a substrate binds, here's our substrate again. Here's that polypeptide that we've been talking about before. When a substrate binds, another portion of the enzyme is brought into close proximity of the water. This B here they're using as a base. I don't like that word, but that's what they're using B for. Guess what B is going to do? It's going to pull that proton off. It's going to make a reactive hydroxyl, which is going to be a nucleophile, which is going to attack. And we're going to see exactly the same thing we saw before. 
Will this have a one step or a two step? <coughs> one step, right? There's no covalent intermediate that's going to be attached to the enzyme. So it's going to, have to go through a one step process and the, the uh, polypeptide will be broken into two pieces and released very quickly. Okay. All right. Um, that's what I want to say there, I think. So um, you guys look tired. Why don't we stand up? Everybody stand up. Okay. This is going to be your moment of zen for today. Okay. Okay. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Yeah. And exhale. And jumping kicks. Okay. Ready? No. All right. Sit down when you feel like sitting down. Maybe you should do that. Okay. We'll just stand here for a minute. Stand for points. Is that what you said? 20 minutes. Well, <laughs> now no peer pressure on standing up. If someone wants to sit down, I think that's okay. That brought a little life to the room. That's good. It's very discouraging to see faces that are just looking like they're in pain. It's kind of like giving an exam, and that's no fun at all, let me tell you. All right. So everything I've said to this point has to do with proteases. So a logical question might be, hey, Kevin, can we talk about something besides proteases? Might we use our knowledge about what we've learned about proteases in another system? Or maybe you're thinking, let's really get off the system completely, but of course, I'm not going to do that at this point. All right, so we're going to talk next about another very interesting enzyme. You've already heard a lot about it already, and you're going to hear more about it. And that's carbonic anhydrase. Carbonic anhydrase um, is not a protease, so there's the good news. And the other good news is you're going to see that carbonic anhydrase does something very much like the proteases did. Okay? So, that means that's one last thing for you to have to memorize. Let's look at what carbonic anhydrase does. You've seen this now several times. Carbonic anhydrase catalyzes the formation of carbonic acid. The starting materials are carbon dioxide and water. And this enzyme, you may recall, has a very high KCAT. Okay? Now this enzyme also has some very odd properties. Very odd properties. Okay? Look at this enzyme. This, and this plot shows on the y-axis the k-cat. You said, well, wait, Kevin, the k-cat you said was constant. Well, it's constant under normal conditions that we talked about. If we start changing those conditions, we're going to change the k-cat. If, if we boil the enzyme, the k-cat's going to go down, right? In this case, the, the equivalent of boiling that we're performing is we're changing the pH of the solution that the enzyme is in. And just like we saw when we used different substrates, we got different k-cats, so too when we use different pHs, we will see different k-cats. This one's really interesting. At a pH of about 6, we see a very low k-cat. When we go to pH 7 or 7.4, which is typically where the uh, enzyme is active in our bodies, we see a pretty hefty k-cat, okay, 800,000 or so. But look at this guy. It keeps going up. Its highest k-cat is not at physiological pH. It's actually at pH 9. The question is why? Okay. Why does the k-cat go so high the higher the pH is that we do? And the answer to that question comes from the mechanism that the enzyme uses. Okay. Now, to understand the, end, the mechanism that it uses, we have to see a little bit about what's happening inside of the active site of carbonic anhydrase. Looky here. 
in the place where the reaction is catalyzed, what do we see? We see a zinc, and we see a zinc holding on to water just exactly like we saw before. The metalloproteases had a zinc that held on to water. Carbonic anhydrase has a zinc that holds on to water. Okay? We see a reaction um, that is actually part of the catalytic uh, mechanism here. Okay? And this reaction involves the ionization of water. If we had nothing else in the active side of this enzyme, if we didn't have that base pulling off the proton, we would see that this reaction would not go very well at all. Why? Well, I'll show you why. Because if all we had was that, what we see in the next uh, mechanism here, oh, not the, I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. Um, what we see is this, okay? Here is the water. Here is the nucleophile that will become important. I'll show you the mechanism in a minute. If we look at the rate with which this happens, well, you know in pure water, water ionizes 1 in 10 to the 7th molecules, 1 in 10 million. If we sit there and wait for water to ionize, guess what's going to happen for this reaction? We're not talking about an enzyme that's going to have a fantastic KCAT. We're talking about an enzyme that's going to be asleep most of the time. So it tells us, first of all, that anything that helps to pull that proton off is going to help to speed the reaction. The enzyme has a base-like molecule that can pull that proton off. That's, that's necessary for the enzyme. But are there other things that we can have present that will, in fact, help to pull that proton off as well? And the answer is absolutely, because you guys have learned about buffers. Okay? We don't do this reaction in pure water. In fact, this reaction occurs in our body in a buffer. It occurs in a bicarbonate buffer, which helps to maintain the pH. And you may recall that buffers are very good at hanging on to protons. Okay? Oop, I keep hitting the wrong one. Okay? If I have a buffer that helps to pull that proton off, I have a, a, a reaction constant that goes from 10 to the minus 7th, 1 in 10 million, to approximately 1 to 1. I've just sped up the reaction with something that pulls protons off by 10 million fold. Okay? Well, okay, that's great. A buffer works really nice, but what about the pH change that I talked about? Well, let's think about this. The higher the pH, what happens to water? It's more likely to form hydroxyls. There's our friend right there. The higher the pH, the more commonly this reaction occurs, and the faster the reaction catalyzed by carbonic anhydrase occurs. Did you have a question? Yeah, what's, um, what kind of bond is the oxygen sharing with the zinc? What kind of a bond is the oxygen sharing with the zinc? That is actually a resonant structure that's there. It's, if you want to think about it simply as, a, as, a, as a, an, like an ionic uh, one, that would be fine as well. But it's, it's a negative attracted to a positive. Well, it's a resonant structure, so yes, it is. Yes, it is. OK. They're using a bond here. That's a hydrogen bond right here. Right? It's, like, it's like a hydrogen bond. And this is electron poor, and that's electron rich. That's not a covalent bond there. Yeah, They're just being sloppy in their designation. OK. Now, so anything that helps to pull the proton off is going to speed this reaction. A higher pH, therefore, is going to make more hydroxides. Therefore, it's going to speed the reaction. That's why we see the enzyme having its maximal activity at pH 9. Why don't we see the enzyme having its maximal activity at pH 14? What's that? Well, all base, all base should be better based on what I just told you. Maximum velocity, no. It changes the protein structure. Okay. Remember that protein structure is, real, you know, is affected by pH. Up to pH 9, this guy is nice and stable. But if I start pulling protons off of everything, I'm going to start changing charges in that protein. I'm going to start changing shape of that protein. And I hope by now you guys know what happens when we change the shape of a protein. We're going to affect its activity. So up to 9, that protein hangs on pretty well. Above 9, 
the protein starts changing its shape to the point where it can't catalyze anymore. Julie? Julie? Sorry, did you say that it was a covalent bond and not an ionic between zinc and oxygen? I said this is a resonant structure. If you want to think about it as, a, as an ionic or covalent, that would be okay, fine. Yeah. I was thinking ionic would be different of charges, covalent would be showing I understand, I understand. But, but don't get hung up on the nature of that bond, okay? Okay, so that's why carbonic anhydrase has the unusual property that it does. I haven't shown you the mechanism. Let me do that for you very briefly. You'll see it's a very common mechanism we've talked about before. Here's the mechanism that the enzyme uses. Zinc bonded to water. Okay. The first step, we have to lose a proton. That can happen by something pulling it off, whether it's a... Uh, a buffer, whether that's a, a portion of the enzyme, doesn't matter, but it creates a reactive hydroxyl group that acts as a nucleophile, okay? And that nucleophile attacks, look at this carbon. That carbon is really electron poor. Oxygen pulling electrons that way, oxygen pulling electrons that way. The lowest density of, of electrons is right at the carbon atom. Oxygen attacks it. That creates this guy right here. This guy right here, which is basically bicarbonate, gets released and regenerates the structure up here. The key point is, again, creation of the nucleophile, the nucleophilic attack, and the release of the bicarbonate. Okay? Make sense? Okay, so hopefully you're starting to see patterns now uh, about how these enzymatic mechanisms are all occurring. All right. Um, how much time have I got? Okay, I'm not going to go through a mechanism. I'm going to do. I'm going to start a story for you, and then I'll tell you the mechanism next time. Okay? I like stories. So the story is that restriction enzymes, which are our next thing to talk about, are really interesting proteins. How many people have used a restriction enzyme in a lab? Okay, so for those of you who haven't, which is the most of the class, restriction enzymes are enzymes, they're also called restriction endonucleases, that cut DNA at specific nucleotide sequences. We think of them as a molecular scissors because they cut DNA precisely at, at very precise places. Okay? Why does a cell, these are produced by cells, why does a cell have something that will cut up DNA? Isn't DNA the genetic material and you want to protect the genetic material? Because if you start cutting up the genetic material, aren't you going to cause problems and kill the cell? The answer is not completely. Restriction endonucleases come from bacteria. And bacteria use them as a kind of an immune system. I like the, the best comparison is an immune system. How does it work? Well, they cut DNA. If I have a virus that, uh, that, that attacks a bacterium, it's called a bacteriophage. It injects its DNA into the bacterium and that restriction endonuclease looks at it and goes, oh boy, chop, 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 cuts it into pieces, virus is dead, cell is protected. Awesome. Why doesn't the restriction endonuclease cut up its own DNA, chop, 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 chop? There's a lot of sites that the enzyme recognizes. Why doesn't it cut its own DNA? The answer is because restriction endonuclease is made also in conjunction with another enzyme called a methylase. Methylase will put methyl groups on that very same site in the DNA that the restriction enzyme wants to cut, and when it does, the enzyme can't cut it. So therefore, the cell's own DNA is protected by methyl groups so that its own restriction enzyme won't cut it. Invading viruses don't have those methyl groups on there. They get chopped to bits. Well, what happens if the methylase gets there first? the virus gets protected. So it's not an absolutely foolproof system, okay? but it works pretty well. That's the reason bacteria have restriction endonucleases. With that said, I'll let you guys go and tell you more next time. How you doing? Uh, slightly less confident about how I did on the test now. Uh-oh. Um, when will we get them back? Um, I told the TAs I hope to give them back by Friday. So okay. we'll, we'll, we'll see. Okay. They've got it, classes of their own and they're great. Yeah. Yep.
my boyfriend's a TA this year at U of O. I hear all about it. Oh, yeah. Um, so you give partial credit, right? So if, well, if we can understand what you did, yeah. Okay, if I got something wrong in the middle, but I did the rest of the problem right with that wrong answer? It depends, yeah, but okay. sure. The more, the more organized, the more you label, the better, more likely you are to get things. So, okay. okay? Well, yeah. Hang in there. We've got two more in the final. Yep. <laughs> Hi, how you doing? Good. Is that a big alley? Yeah. Yeah. David, how you doing?